All right, I can't waste your time. I need you to enjoy your weekend. Uh, welcome to our session today uh, in preparation to for our test. Uh, may you please note that whatever I'm going to cover today doesn't necessarily mean that is the entirety of what we are covering, but this is just uh, to remind us of some of the concepts that we have already covered. And uh, your test should be covering everything that we have done so far uh, everything that we have done so far so uh, just make sure that maybe you find time to uh, revise some of the things that we've done so you could see that things like that i'm not looking at them because we've done a lot on that so that's why I've deliberately, I've deliberately put it at the, uh, at the end and we might not even do it, but it doesn't mean that you should not do it. It's, uh, I only needed us to uh, do a revision on some of the things that we haven't revised. We just did, but did not revise. But fat, it seems like fat, we revised a lot of times. Things like what is income, what is expenditure, we revised them a lot of times on various occasions. So that's why I... I decided to look at the areas that I'll be looking at. So be prepared to be asked on anything that we've done so far in your test. Right. So uh, I'm going to use some of the things that uh, I've sent to you uh, for illustration. Right. We'll start from question one of the document that I've sent to you. Right. The question one, defend the five private limited manufacturers sell defense weapons in Johannesburg, South Africa. The company's manufacturing process has been approved by <clears throat> as is a qualifying process of manufacture. The company is not a small business corporation as defined in the income tax act. My friends, I will also talk about um, uh, the provisions where relevant if the company could have been a, a small business corporation as we go because i normally i would put a question uh, on a small business corporation and another one of a business which is not a small business corporation so that you could see them clearly but because of today's time time limitation i didn't have time in the morning uh, if i had time in the morning i was going to do that so we're only going to use the this one but i will be able to discuss with you what you could have done if in case the business was not a small business corporation right uh, right. Uh, the, com the company is registered as category A value added tax vendor, making only a uh, taxable supplies. So that means where applicable, that should be taken into account. Defendify financial year ends on the last day of March. Uh, that means our financial year ends in March. It's really very, very, very important, especially when we try to determine the prepayments and their deductibility. We might need, uh, and when we determine the capital allowances, some of them are portioned. Remember, this is not a small business corporation, so we know that uh, for all those assets that we use the general binding ruling, we might need to apportion um, when it's here. So that can be very important. Right. Uh, you have been appointed as the tax manager of ABC Accounting and Defendify. Private Limited is your new client. The following transaction relate to the 2022 year of assessment. Right. The question is, calculate the taxable income of Defendify for the 2022 year of assessment. Right. So we can have our... Uh, one calculation of taxable income of Defendify for the twenty twenty two year of assessment. Right. When you are calculating uh, the 
take a taxable income of a company or the tax liability of a company. Normally, you need one big column for the details, and then you might need at least two columns, a, one for your final amounts and one for workings. So normally, I will provide for two columns so that maybe the you can, or, or even three, we can even make them three. This can be for, in, just in case, it is uh, advisable to just make them three, just in case you might need uh, all of them. In case if you don't need another one, then don't worry, it doesn't uh, harm you. All right, so the reason why, this first two, I might need them for working. For example, let's say if you sell an asset, I might put the selling price here, and in this column, I calculate the tax base. After getting the tax base, I export it to the second column. Then when I find the difference between the selling price and the, and the tax base, then I can be able to export it to the, to the third column where I'll be putting my final amounts. Like uh, sometimes in tax, we don't do like what we do in the financial accounting whereby we normally do the calculations somewhere and then we'll be exporting them to the answer. Normally for tax, we just do all the calculations there uh, within the answer. So that's why I advise that if you're calculating the tax of a company, just make them three columns, smaller, smaller columns in, uh, 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 in addition to the bigger column for the details. So just if a monetary amounts columns, uh, three, uh, three of them, uh, that would be fine. Right, uh, now remember that the figures that we include in the calculation of the taxable income for a VAT vendor should be excluding VAT. The amount should be excluding VAT for a VAT vendor. Then um, uh, if it's not a VAT vendor, there's no need to exclude VAT. Uh, uh, because to them, they can't claim the fact. So the cost of, for example, the cost of an asset will include that. Right, so now let's look at um, these things. Number one, uh, included uh, in the uh, sales amount of 4.5 4 million is an advance payment of 30,000 uh, received from a customer in respect of a paper spray order still to be manufactured. Uh, the quoted selling price uh, is uh, 85,000 and it should cost uh, 60,000 to manufacture the paper spray. It is estimated that the transaction will be finalized within three months after the year end of the current year of assessment. The specific gross profit percentage of the data can be applied to the allowance uh, is the commissioner approved the allowance? Right. Uh, right. Now we have a scenario whereby uh, the selling price is 85 percent, 85,000, and uh, the, co the total cost would be 60,000, uh, but so far they've received a, a 30,000 only. So when they say that the specific gross percentage can be applied to the allowance as the commissioners approved, approved the allowance, it means that we can be allowed to, since we have not yet finished, remember that this deal has not been finished. So we can be allowed to deduct a cost that is also a proportional to the work that has already been done so far. The whole contract is going to be 85,000. And out of that, we have received 30,000. So that means, remember that ASAS that advance payment they will take us. So by saying that the commissioner is allowed the approved allowance, it simply means that a, this client can also claim a proportional cost mm -hmm. that is related to this uh, to the amount received so far. The total cost is going to be sixty, but we can't claim the whole sixty because we are not yet done. So we we'll only claim costs that are in proportion to the thirty thousand that we have already received. Right, so 
we are going to say, okay, maybe so that it can be clear at the cells. That is 4.5 million. Right. Then we deduct the allowance. The section 12 C allowance. That is, a, so this one would be the proportional al al allowance. So we would say, we know that we've received 30,000 out of 85,000. Whereas our total cost is going to be 60,000. So we can't claim the total cost because we are not yet done. So we'll only claim the proportional cost. What do we get? Thank you. Two thousand. It's what? Twenty one thousand one hundred and seventy six comma forty seven. Twenty one one seventy six. So we're saying the uh, the cost that is attributable to the thirty thousand that we've received so far is twenty one thousand one hundred and seventy six. So SARS will be saying. For that income that we have already recognized, will allow you to also deduct a proportional cost. You can't. You, you have not yet received the full eighty-five. We have not yet uh, uh, recognized the full eighty-five revenue. So they have only recognized your taxable income for the thirty thousand that you have received. All right. Then there was a question about that. Let me just see what what, what the question is about. There is no way that we are told that this amount includes VAT. They just said this is a VAT vendor. So you cannot just assume that the amount includes VAT. Remember that for your exams, whether the, uh, the company is a VAT vendor or not, uh, you are supposed to uh, check if the amount includes or excludes VAT. Normally, they will tell you uh, 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 that the amount includes or excludes VAT. So we cannot just assume, although it's a fat vein that don't just assume that the amount includes fat. Yes, making taxable supplies does not mean that the amount includes fat. Even if you are making a taxable supplies, you can give amounts that are excluding fat for your sales. Remember that your sales account in your books will be excluding fat. So they, they are a fat vendor, they are, they are making taxable supplies, but they didn't state that the amounts include fat. Uh, how happened? No way, it stated that the oh, amount. Uh, so always yourself, check guys. The... Hello? Okay, so always check if the amount includes or excludes that, but what there's nothing that we are told so far that shows that the amount includes that. All right, uh, so uh, that's what it means when they say you apply the specific gross profit percentage. That means if you receive an advance amount, for work that you are still completing, and that amount is taxable by SARS, you are allowed to deduct a proportional percentage of the what of the cost. Uh, but the commissioner can determine another formula, and they will always tell you. Right. Number two, purchases amounted to 1.5, and the cost of opening and closing inventory were 556,000 and 765,000 respectively. The market value of opening and closing inventory were 665,000 and 578,000 respectively. Number one, our purchases opening, inventory are deducted. Purchases and opening inventory are deducted. Very sorry. Purchases and opening inventory are deducted, whereas closing inventory is added. That is just like our normal accounting procedure. There's no difference there. Remember, uh, by, when you calculate your cost of sales, which you subtract from sales in your accounting, 
you say opening inventory plus purchases minus closing inventory. By subtracting closing inventory, you are just like adding it to your profit. So it's just the same as the uh, accounting procedure. Right. So we uh, we subtract purchases and opening inventory, and we add closing inventory when calculating our taxable income. Always, it doesn't change. But on the opening inventory and closing inventory, remember we apply the same procedure as IS2 is applied by SAS, whereby our inventory is recorded at the lower of cost and net realizable value. So you compare your cost, your, your cost to the net realizable value and take whatever amount is lower. Right. So, like in this case, uh, so our purchases would deduct as it is the 1.5. So we're going to have purchases 1.5. Right. Then opening inventory. Our opening inventory will compare the cost to the net a realizable value. Right. A, our opening inventory, the cost is 556. The net the market value or net realized value is 665,000. So we use the lower of the two, of which the lower is the cost. So we'd use 556,000 for opening inventory. Uh, so we'd say use lower cost, which is what? Remember that our opening inventory will subtract. Then the closing inventory, you also check which one is lower, the cost or market value. Yeah, our cost is 765. Our market value is 578. As you can see, the market value is lower at 578. So we're going to add the market value. Yes, you can ask your question. Uh, uh, Mister, I just wanted to know that one, um, um, the first, the, the the first one that you did, the I, I think you said, section twenty four C, something like that. I just wanted to know that section twenty four, it deals with with what, um, uh, what uh, I was describing, advance payments that have been received. Advanced payments. Uh. All right. Thank you. Right. So here it would use the lower, the lower what? The lower, which is the cost. So we'll not use the 765. Would we'll use this a 578, which is the lower one. So we we'll have. So here would we'll say use lower market value. And my friends. The closing inventory, I repeat, we add closing inventory is added. Closing inventory is added. So purchases and the opening inventory, we subtract. Closing inventory, we add. And for both opening and closing inventory, you use the lower of the cost and market value, which we uh, like, just like in FAC, where you say lower of cost and net realizable value. Right, before I proceed, any questions on number two? Mr. Eugene? Yes. Um, if we don't mention that um, section, what, 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 do we get penalized? No, there's no, there's no problem. When you forget, please don't worry, don't, don't, don't stress much about it. All right. It's just like when you say opening inventory and you don't write that use the lower cost, you will still get your money. But if you remember, remember that in text, if you remember, you can always write that this is a section 12C, this is a, a, a section 12E, this is section 24C. If you remember, please write. But if you've clearly forgotten, don't waste your time uh, writing uh, wrong things. It's rather bit, it's safer to ignore if you have forgotten. You can just say allowance. Okay. Thank you, sir. 
But if you remember, you can write it, please. Right, on 17, okay, so if we don't have any questions on number two, I'll, I'll move on to number three. On 17 August 2021, Defendify purchased the raw material for 14,000 free on board from a supplier in Canada to manufacture Tesla guns. The order was placed on 17 August to be delivered as soon as possible, and the date was settled on 15 April 2022. The following ruling exchange rate uh, was applied. Right, when you buy goods in Forex, uh, they should be translated to a local currency for tax purposes. There are is a set of implications that will be there. Number one, on the day, what we call the transaction date, you should translate those goods, that purchase price to a local currency. You recognize the transaction to a local currency on the, a, what we call the transaction date. The transaction date normally depends with the type of sale. If it's free on board, Okay, or cost whatever insurance and freight, what the what they call CIF. We use the shipping date, the date of shipping. That's the transaction date. Right. Like in this case, a, for a free on board, although they didn't specify the date of shipping, we can just assume that that was they said it as soon as possible. So we assume that 17 August was the shipping date. But if they'd given us a, a, a different shipping date. Uh, we're going to use a different one. So that means we're going to uh, uh, translate this at this exchange rate. Right. Uh, if you have not yet paid, okay. Uh, sorry, pay. Mr. Jean. Yes. Hi, um, because you are saying uh, we are using the 17th August as the shipping date. So let's say maybe they purchase on the 17th and then the shipping date, let's say is the 30th August. Are we then using you the date? All right, sharp. You use that shipping date. As long as it's a, a free on board, it's cost insurance freight, which you call CIF, you use the shipping date. And usually you find that in most exams, that's what happens, like what you are saying, my sister, we buy the order and the shipping date are different. So you use the shipping date to translate the goods. So Mr. We've, we've got other sales, for example, what is called a cash on delivery sale, COD sale. With a COD sale, the risks and rewards are transferred on the date that the goods are received by the buyer. So we'd use the date when the goods are received by the buyer. Mr. Eugene? Yes, sir. Yeah, repeat that one, please. I said, we have got other different sales, for example, a cash on delivery sale, what is called a COD sale. With a cash on delivery sale, the risks and rewards are transferred when the buyer receives the goods. So the transaction date will be the date that the goods get into the hands of the buyer. Okay. All together. But if it's a free on board, if it's a CIF, you use the shipping date. Right. So in this case, this is a free on board sale. So we're going to use the shipping date and would assume that it's 17 August. So that's number one. Okay, let me just deal with that number one. So we'd say what a purchase is. Of raw materials. Okay, which is equal to what? They bought in the US dollars 14 and one dollar is 1789. So say 14,000 times 1789. What do you get? 25460. Thank you. Right, my friends, uh, I think uh, my colleague who is just speaking right now, uh, uh, the question, uh, who was just speaking right now with the question some other time in our inbox, he was asking about the multiplication and division. 
So I just feel that I can also talk about it right now. If you can see here, we are buying in dollars and it's one dollar is to 17 rand 89. So that's why you, when we multiply, uh, if it was one rand is to so many dollars, then we're going to uh, divide. So, uh, but normally they give us uh, in this way. So that's why usually we just multiply. But if you are given in case, if our exchange rate was given as one rand is equal to so many dollars, then instead of multiplying, we're going to divide. If it's one rand is equal to so many, whatever Forex that you are given. Oh, so, uh -huh. oh, so then when it's like this, the way they, they've given it like this, it means the, 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 the rand is, is lower than the dollar. No, it case. doesn't mean that. How about if it's dollar is equal to a rand 0 0.45? Uh -huh. It doesn't necessarily mean that. So we just have to follow the, the this rule that if, uh, let's if say, it's one one dollar or one franc is to so many runs, then you have to multiply whatever it is, uh, the runs if they are zero comma or they are 17 point, it doesn't necessarily follow that maybe it's stronger or whatever. Because you can be given like this, my friend. What I'm trying to tell you, it can be one rand. Sorry, 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 sorry. It can be one dollar is equal to 0 0.65. The okay. rand will be strong, but you still multiply. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, right. I did it. So as long as it's one dollar is equal to a certain quantity of runs, you multiply. But if it's given as one rand is equal to dollars, let's say 0 0.45, in this case, you divide altogether. Even if it's right. one rand is equal to dollars 18, you divide. Is that right? Yeah, I understand now. One is in rand. Yeah. yeah, I understand. See. Okay, so so that's when you so you should know that's when you divide and when you what when you multiply, right? So please, I was just trying to help my brother with a discussion. Uh, I I I had to help a friend there with the discussion, but it was just for our tab. So I wanted to make it clear whilst we were talking there. And I know it could help you also. Right, that's number one. On the transaction date, you translate. Number two, my friends, at year end, if the amount has not yet been paid, you have to account for any foreign exchange gain or foreign exchange losses. Right. Here, yeah, one rand, uh, our year end is in March 31. Uh, our rand, we have not yet paid. Remember that we are paying on 15 April. Our rand is now going to 18.45 from 17.89 to the dollar. So there's a loss because the rand is deteriorated. Uh, if you are owing money, if you are owing money, if the rand deteriorates, there will be a foreign, foreign exchange loss. If you are owing money and the rand deteriorates, there's a loss there because you now have to pay more than what you were supposed to pay on the transaction date. But if you are owed, if you are owed money, there's a foreign exchange gain if the rand deteriorates. Why? Because uh, remember that your debt is foreign currency denominated. So that means you will now be entitled to receive more in runs. Right. So in this case, uh, the rand is deteriorated from 1789 to 1845, and we are owing. So that means we now have to owe more money. So there is a loss, and that loss it is allowed as a deduction by SAS, even if you have not yet paid. So all your, your, your foreign currency denominated debts, if you have not yet paid them by end of year and there's been a movement in the exchange rate, any foreign exchange loss, you are, it's, it's deductible. Any foreign exchange gain is taxable. If it was a gain, 
let's say if the rate was now below 1789, we're going to edit your taxable income. But because this is a loss, we're going to subtract it. So we have got the what? Foreign exchange loss. Which is 14,000 multiplied by the difference between the currencies. That is 18.45, the new current minus 17.89. What do you get? So it's just like what we do also in FAC. Zero point five six. I wanted the final answer here. Fourteen thousand by seven thousand forty. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Seven eight four zero. Eugene. Yes, my boss. Hey, me. I'm confused. If it was me doing it alone, I was gonna subtract. Uh, the one of 15 April 18 rand 75. I can't hear you. No, remember mm -hmm. that we said you should maybe you should follow what I said. I said at year end, I'm not even talking about we're not yet on 15 April. Okay, remember the procedure that I, the procedure that I talked about. I never talked about the payment date. I said, I will repeat. At end of your year of assessment, when you are reporting to SAS, if you are still owing and you have not yet paid any foreign denominated debt, you should determine any gain or loss on foreign currency. We are on 31 March. We are not on 15 April. Our year of assessment, remember, it's ending on 31 March. All right. So we are on set one March when we are presenting. Remember that you, you have to submit your returns by set one March. They, they will be up to set one. Of course, you submit after set one March, but they will be up to set one March. Your year end, your financial year end. You present yearly. Remember, you are a taxpayer. Your take year of assessment ends on set one March. So on that set one March, that's when you are determining if there's a loss or gain. Is that right? You have not yet paid. We are not yet on when you are reporting, we are not yet on 15 April. We are on 31 March. Is that right? All right. Okay, Mr. Benjamin. Okay, so that's what we have to do. Then, so that's it for this question. But if we were doing the other year, on 15 April, when the payment is done again here, you also have to account for what? For any movement from that year end. From 1845 to 1875, there will be another loss. But that one now is now in the 2023 year of assessment. We don't care about it now. The payment is, no, is not happening in the year that we are assessing. It's in the next year. So that will be done in the tax a, a, a assessment for next year. That's where you account for the loss now from 1845 to 1875. And then the payment will be done. Does that answer you, Mr. Benjamin? There? Yes, it makes perfect sense. Thank okay. you. So the 1845 will be accounted for when on the date of payment on 15. So on that date of payment, so if this payment had been done during the year, instead of waiting for year end, we're going to say on that date of the payment, we're going to check any movements in the exchange rate. Noted. Thank you. Right. Uh, right. Next. Can I move on? So please. Uh, okay. Let me just repeat. Number one on the transaction date. A uh, translate. A, the acquisition at the spot rate. It can be an asset. You use the same rules. Number two, at the end of the a, reporting period, if there's any unpaid amount, a, account for any foreign exchange div, a, a, losses or gains. 
Then on payment date again, account for exchange losses or gain. But here we didn't talk about the payment date because it falls outside our reporting period. All right. Okay, so I'll move on to number four. All right. The company leases a few of its delivery trucks in terms of finance leases. The installments are all payable over 48 months. You are provided with the following information. The installments for the year, including VAT, 280,000. A VAT element included installments for the year. Right, like this year now, uh, uh, Mr. Roshan, that's where now you see that they have actually told us that this includes VAT. So when we account for it, we should exclude VAT. Right, when you are in a finance lease agreement, there is a difference between accounting and SAS. I think when we're doing FAC, we talked about uh, if it's a finance lease, there will be the right of use asset and all those things. Uh, but when you are dealing with SAS, if you acquire an asset under a finance lease, that's not your asset. You don't even record that asset in your book. But you record deductions for the uh, installments that you are paid. Right. So our installment is 280,000. So we're going to say list installments. So list install installments are deductible. List installments are deductible. Right. So we'll say uh, 280,000. Apply by 100 divided by 115. We have to take out the VAT. What do we get? $243,478. And my friend, let's not forget, uh, we talked about um, lease premiums. We said we allocate them over the lease period. We spread them. If there's a lease premium that you are paying in advance, uh, we, we remember that we said you have to uh, divide it by the number of years and spread it over the years of the lease. We also talked about lease improvements, obligatory lease improvements that are specified. Let's say you agree with the landlord that uh, you should uh, make improvements lease improvements on the property according to an agreement. Remember, we also said that a, we are supposed to allocate them over the lease term. The remaining lease term from the date that the improvements are completed. So please, those are some of the things that we can expect anytime. But we did them, I think, 100 times. That's why I'm not going to go back on them. Right. So that's it. Um, Mr. Eugene, um, can I just take yes. you back a bit? Yes. On on the foreign on the foreign exchange, ne? Uh, let's yes. say the payment uh, the payment date was within our year end, ne? Um, yes. I just want to find out the, the 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 difference between the exchange rates. Was it going to be between the year end and the payment date, or the 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 spot rate and the payment date? No, the year end. The first one that you said, year end and payment. Was, remember okay. that the, the, the movement from the transaction date to year end has already been taken, taken into account. So we'll yeah. no longer talk about the transaction date. So on 15 April, we'll be looking at the movement from March to 15 April. Okay, all right. Thank Thanks. you, Matthew. Right, any other questions, my friend? Please ask anything to do with the, that part that we are doing. Our intention is not to finish the questions anyway. Is to do as much as possible and understand it. Uh, Eugene? Yes. Uh, this is Roshan here again. Uh, I'm just going back to point three. Yes. With regard to that 1789 and... Uh, that was the shipping date and the year-end date where we do the exchange rate at 1845. 
Yes. But in the current year, before March, if we had had to pay the supplier, the overseas supplier, and the rate was different, we still have to account for the gain and losses on the payment because obviously the rate will be much different. No, remember I said uh, at year end, we only account for an amount that is outstanding. So if it's uh, paid before year end, we don't do anything at year end. But it's There'll be no outstanding. gains or losses. No, 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 no. We only, uh, if let's say, for example, let me give, give an example. Let's say this amount had been paid, let's say on 31 January 2022. Uh -huh. On 31 January 2022, we're going to account for the loss or gain from 17 August. And okay. that's it. That date is no longer in the book, so we we'll no longer talk about it anymore. That okay, means let's on, say, 31 let's January, say, on 31 March, we're not going to do anything. Let's say the payment was made before the 31st of March 2022. Let's say it was done in February, but at the it, rate it, of that's say, the example uh, that I just gave. I said 31 January. Yes. Is that right? If it's okay. done in February, in that February, on uh, like on that date in February, when you pay, that's when you account for the loss or gain. Okay. Does that answer you? I just I'm just talking from a point where you say shipping date is at a certain rate that you are when the goods leave the, the country where you're purchasing from, and at the time when the, the, the customer makes the payment, the rates are different. It could be either at year end or before year end. So there could be a, a, a gain or loss based on yeah. the difference in yeah. rates. On the payment debt, whether it's before year end or what, on that very payment debt, you account for the gains or losses. Okay, that's what I want to know. Okay. Yes. Whenever whenever the payment happens, whether it has happened before year end or what, that day that the payment happens, you account for the gain or loss. And if okay. it's already changed, that means at year end, you won't even uh, you won't even have to do any adjustment. And there can be okay. a different scenario. Uh, you can be told that of this 14,000, 10,000 was paid in January. The other four is outstanding at year end. OK, uh, yeah, I understand it now. Thank you. Yes. So uh, like I, I'm just going further so that we can also we can also explore other scenarios. Say, Is that right? Uh, actually, I like your question because it is opening up something that I haven't explained also. Right. It can happen that you are told that uh, on 31 January, the exchange rate is 17. Uh, 99 one dollar is to 17.99 this is only uh, let's say this is only 17 january and on that date that is 2022 before year end then they pay 10,000 on that date so on this day we'll just calculate the profit or loss on this 10,000 that is being paid only not the full 14,000 only on the amount that is being paid on that date who account for the uh, loss then on 31 march who then account for the loss only on the balance now that is the 4000 and now the difference will be from the transaction date that is a uh, 1845 minus 1789 times 14 for times the 4000 that is outstanding so at year end we only account for the difference a uh, for a foreign exchange loss or foreign exchange gain for the outstanding balance at year end. Only that amount that is still outstanding at year end. So it can be possible that you can even, they can be, the amount can be paid in bits and pieces. So on payment debt, we only account for the foreign exchange loss or gain on the amount that is being paid on that date. Then at year end, we account for the foreign exchange gain or loss on the outstanding amount only i hope that that classifies everything i'm fine with that thank you okay thank you guys thank you for the questions they hope also uh, because there are some who can also be helped who might not have thought about that angle also but when we now explore it they now also see a, a differences why do we discuss um, these differences Mr. your questions can have these other angles yes um just this this last question Agri, when you like on the on Don't the last question my, my boss <laughs> yeah yeah i'm just uh, for, for <laughs> this particular one. On, one. <laughs> um, okay. on the on the 15th of april when that guy will be paying 
when yes. when the debt will be settled agree when we account for 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 when we account for, for for the gain or loss we will be using the we will be using the, the the change that happened from that occurred from the 31st march until the 15th of april yes all right thank you thank you so much right i'm now going to number five a, the data click indicated that the list of doubtful dates amounted to 450,000. And that 40% of the list of doubtful dates are in areas for more than 60, 60 days, but less than 120 days. Defend five does not apply uh, if it's nine. All right, what would be the doubtful dates allowance? How do we calculate the doubtful data allowance? Right. We should know that uh, if the debts are owing for less than, uh, you said 270,000. Where is the 270,000 coming from? Right. Uh, our I'm say, I'm sorry, Eugene. I'm saying 450,000. Less the forty percent, which of the of the list of debtors that are still in arrears. So out of the four fifty, forty percent are still in arrears, so you can't count doubtful debts on that. Uh, right. Uh, what happens? The doubtful debt allowance for debts that are sixty days owing or more, but less sixty to one twenty days. Is that right? 60 to 120 days, 62, not 120 to a uh, less than 120. Is that right? You use 25 percent. Then 120 or more. What percent? Right, let me just uh, put it in other words. Uh, when SARS are granting you the doubtful debt allowance, uh, it will be 25%. Uh, you will be granted 25% allowance on debts that are owing from 60 days up to 120, not including 120. But if your debts are owing for 120 days or more, SARS will grant you 40% a doubtful debt allowance as a deduction. And if they are less than 60 days, there is no allowance granted there. They are not yet doubtful in other words. I repeat, less than 60 days, no doubtful debt allowance. 60 to 120, 25% of the list. 120 days or more, 40%. So in this case, we have got 40% of the debts that are 60 days or more, 40%. So the allowance, you are only going to get the allowance on this 40% of the debts, not on all the debts. And you only get 25% because they are owing for more than 60, but less than what? 120 days. So that means our doubtful debt allowance here is going to be 450,000 times 40%. So 450,000 times 40% are the debts that will qualify for the allowance because they are owing for more than 60 days, but less than 120. So they will qualify for 25% doubtful debt allowance. Right. The first 40% is to simply calculate, according to the question, the proportion of the debts that will qualify for the allowance. According to the question, 40% of the debts 
are owing for more than 60 days, but less than 120. Right. And then uh, the other uh, the other debt of 60%, that means they are owing for less than 60 days. So they will not qualify for the for the deduction. So there's no deduction on those ones. At this moment, I would like to uh, check if there are any questions regarding that. Uh, um, I just I just want you to call to I, I just want you to confirm this because um I could on on the notes you said um twenty five percent of the deaths that are due for sixty days or more, but less then, than one twenty. But less than one twenty. Yes. Okay. Oh, no, right, just sixty days or more. I said sixty days up to one twenty. And I put a less than 120 that they should not uh, uh, be up to 120, less than uh, 120. So those ones qualify for 25%? Yes. All right. Another question? And then and then 40%, I mean, and then 120 If days they were going for more than 40. 120 days. But we're going to use 40%. 40, like this right. date, if, if they were owing for more than 120 days, we're going to multiply instead of 20, where do we put 25, we're going to put another 40% there. Right. Okay. Any questions, my friends? There? Okay. So what do we get? 45,000. What five thousand? No slide lies. Put it at sixty to one nineteen. We just say no any less than one twenty. Because it can be one nineteen in that. <laughs> okay, let's say uh, let's let's just say it's one nineteen to be safe. But just know that as long as they are not one twenty, as long as they are not one twenty. When they become 120, you know, the 40% kicks in. All right, the following information relates to the assets held by the company. Defend if I purchased a plot of land on 10 July 2008 and erected a factory building on the land. The plot of land was originally acquired for 450,000, including VAT. Right, the acquisition of the land does not affect the current year in any way, it's of a capital nature. So if it's of a capital nature, eh, we can only account for allowances, not the acquisition in the calculation of the taxable income. Remember, when we look at deductions, they should not be of a capital nature. Right. Eh, and the factory was erected on 1 October for 900,000, including VAT, and brought into use on 30 November 2018, 2008. As defined by is a VAT vendor making 100% taxable supplies, the company could claim the input tax uh, uh, on the original transaction for the plot of land and the factory building. So we should remember that when we now start to grant capital allowances, we should take out the VAT. We should take out the VAT. Right. Uh, the following costs were incurred while the company owned the factory building and plot of land. Bond registration costs 6.5. Interest paid on mortgage bond, portion relating to 22 year of assessment, 50,000. Is 50,000, right? Uh, so we have interest paid on the mortgage. Interest paid on mortgage is an expense. It's a deduction. Registration of the bond, I didn't talk about it because uh, it's part of a capital nature. So it is added to the cost of the asset. We're going to include it when we uh, determine the capital allowances. All right. 
then improvements to the factory building on 15 August, 250,000. And then advertising costs to find a buyer for the asset, 15,000. The plot of land and factory building was sold as a unit on 31 January 2022, respectively. For 500 land and 2 million to an unconnected person. Right, so that means there are capital gains issues there. There are capital gains issues. We have to determine the capital gain. Remember that 80% of capital gain will be included in taxable income. Right. So let's look at the, let's start uh, by looking at the factory building. Factory building. Purchase price. Right. Our biggest building was acquired for $990,000. Right. They said that it's exclude it's including part. What do you get? Eight six eight four two one. Right, thank you guys. Remember that why I did I use fourteen percent because they talked about two thousand eight, uh, the acquisition date. Right, then We have got uh, improvements. Two fifty thousand. Capital allowances. Remember that a uh, on a factory building, the allowance is five percent. So say eight six eight four two one. Multiply by how many years? Don't don't count to 2008 because it was bought in November. I think they said that it was uh, brought into use in uh, brought into use in November. So the allowance will start from 2009. Maybe to be clear, let me just say 2009 years so that we, we don't get lost. So times five percent times how many years? Ten 
18 years. Then plus 250,000 times 5%. Times the that is for the improvements. The improvements were in August 2016, so it would start from 2017. Five years. Thank you. What do we get? So please, the first part is for the uh, land, the building, original building. The second part is for the improvements. Remember that the improvements are also entitled to a capital allowance at the same rate. But if it was a leasehold improvement, then you would, uh, for the improvements, you're only going to look at the remaining years up to the end of the lease. But now this one is not a leasehold improvement, it's the other factory office building. I'm saying. So, yes. Uh, why is the capital allowance uh, dates from 2009 to 2021? Because I thought the year end is 22. No, remember that it was sold. We would need to determine the capital gain. Oh, okay. So, okay. so it's yeah, it's not going to go in our calculation of that tax. But when you want when you wanted the capital gain, you would need the base cost. You'd need everything. Remember. All right. Mr. Uh Eugene. -huh. Yes, sir. Uh, um. Did this one so. Does this mean that, like, like you did here, does this mean that if the improvements were done on the asset, um, the date which the, the asset was acquired and the date which the, the improvements were made on the asset, that means you are going to, you are going to calculate um, the allowance um, separately and add them together? No, I was not going to separate, I was just, just, yeah, just joined it. But the, the, you, I only I only I, I separated because they were at different dates. Different dates. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. That if the so does this mean that if the 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 the, the date of acquiring the asset and the date of the improvements are are different, then that means you you just gonna um uh, uh, calculate different things separately and then add them together. Yes, separation is to help you so that you do everything ac accurately because the years are different. Okay. Because if you join them and the years are different, you are likely to get to a wrong answer. You see that? All right. All right, good. Actually, there are many ways to, to do this calculation and you get the same answer. 626974. Actually, you could uh, start with the first one, then you just uh, depreciate it up to 2016 uh, on its own. Then you combine them, then you uh, together, then you put the weight up to 2021. You're still going to get the same answer. All right. Uh, someone, my sister was asking that this one was for 20, 2009. That's why I ended on 2021 here. Then now, I will now talk about what? Capital allowance for 2022. Because the 2022 one, we need it this time. That's why I'm doing it separately. I hope that answers my sister who was asking, uh, why are you calculating 2021? The 2021 and stuff like that, it's for the sake of determining our tax base. Right, then this one is for this year. Okay, and again, my brother was asking about combining. For this year, I don't have to separate. I can combine them. What do you get? Mr. Eugene? Yes, sir. Um, the purchase price of the factory building, the VAT that you use there, is it 14%? Yes, because it was acquired in 2008. Oh, so uh, it was still 14. Okay, no, it's fine. Yes. 
right. Then this one, my sister, who, are, who was asking about uh, 2022 now, I, I put it separately, and then the, the allowance for 2022 goes now in our column here, or in our main column here. Right. Then why we needed the That's our tax value. Are we together? Right. Our selling price. million and this is to an unconnected person right how about if it's to, an, to a connected person what is the implication my friend if the cell is to a connected person what would be the implication The implication is that the amount considered to be the consideration there will be the higher of the actual amount that was paid and the market value. Because unconnected persons, sometimes they can do favors. The deal can okay, sometimes it's not at arm's length. So uh, that's what will happen there. So we'll say two million. Let's take value. We get recruitment remember that recruitment is limited to previous capital allowances claims which is the capital allowances that we claimed above the, it's what? Is 626974 plus 55921. What do you get? Six eight two eight nine five. Eugene, before you before you continue, can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Um, on capital allowances, two thousand and nine to twenty twenty one. Is it that six two six, not two zero three six one eight? Isn't that what? Is it that six two six nine seven four that you've got there, or is it two zero three six one eight? Please confirm. For hey, me my friends, uh, she's three. saying that this is not six two six. I'm getting two zero three six one eight point four one. She's getting two zero three. Two zero three six. Did you add the two figures, my sister? I did. When I when I calculate, I get the same amount. It's just that um, you rounded off, yes. Yeah. 
it's I, I it's think others right. are just getting that six to six. I think is the are you using a financial calculator? Yes. If you are using a financial calculator, you'd be very careful with your brackets and stuff like that. Because okay. sometimes the financial calculator does not follow the rules of mathematics. You should be very careful. Otherwise, if you are using a financial calculator, I urge you to first calculate the first part, then the second part separately. Because okay. they are still getting the same answer. And they are saying it's correct. Can you just quickly do it for the last time so that we can see if you are winning? And make sure that the 13 and the 5 is 13, not 13%. 13 the 5 is 5, not 5%. Five it's years, 5 years, 13 years. I'm still getting the 203. I'll, I'll, I'll keep checking and see what I'm getting wrong. It's okay. No, maybe don't. Uh, actually, I would urge you that don't check now. Mm. Otherwise, it will disturb you. Check after the class. Then if it's okay. still a problem, you call me. No problem. Thank I you. I will also try with my calculator, then we verify. No problem. Let it not disturb you for now. Thank right. you. Right. Okay, my friends, you don't cl claim all this recruitment. You, you can only claim recruitment up to the capital allowances that you have, um, you have, uh, you have uh, claimed. So you only be checked, sorry, the recruitment only on the capital allowances that you claim. So our recruitment would be the 682.895. It is added to your taxable income. It's just like a profit on sale, which we, in accounting, what we call profit on sale. So that is the amount which is uh, called recruitment. Right. Then so, we um, would determine our base cost. To determine our uh, base cost, of the assets. Mister? Yes. Yeah, Mr. I just want to ask, um, um, why do we say the debt capital allowances um, from, from 2009 to 2021 is the recruitment here? I don't understand your question. Can you repeat, please? I can, I can see you, you, you guys are saying 626.974 plus 55,921 are the recruitment from the previous years. Uh, so I just want to ask, why do you say so? Like I, I'm That's what generous. I said. That it, remember, I said recruitment is always, this is, this is tax law. Recruitment, it's you can only claim your recruitment up to the maximum of the capital allowance that you claim. So oh, if, you calculate, yeah. if you calculate your recruitment like this first, first of all, you have to calculate like this. As long as it's less than 682, you take it as it is. Oh, yeah, I understand now. No, continue, yes. continue. But I get, it I get can you. only, the mark, this one, it gives us the limit. Is yeah. that the maximum that you can claim? Oh, yeah, I get it. I get it, see. Okay, okay, it's okay. Now I'm not talking about you only. So please, guys, if our recruitment year is less than the allowance is claimed, you take it as it is. This limit is only applied if the total recruitment is more than the allowance is previously claimed. That's when you apply the limit. Right. Then we we'll then determine our base cost. Uh, there was uh, someone who was asking the other day that a, a, is the tax base always equal to the tax value? Then I said in all the situations that we're dealing with, it was like that. Uh, usually there are differences when it comes to um, some assets in some circumstances, right? There are costs that are not included in the calculation of the number one, you can have assets that were acquired before 2001. They can be different. Right, number two, also there can be other expenses that are on the question which a, do not come into the calculation of the tax value, but can be included in the calculation of the base cost. All right. A, what are these items? Uh, 
that I'm talking about. Right. A, for example, if you acquire an asset and you do this advertising and stuff like that, the advertising of an asset for sale will, will, will be part of advertising cost will be part of the base cost. If you market the commission that you pay uh, for marketing the, 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 the asset will be part of the base cost. If you still remember in our class when we were doing capital um, gains tax, we said there, are, uh, uh, there were expenses that we said can be included in the, the base cost of an asset. And we said that there were expenses that are not included in the base cost of an asset. So we, we have to be very careful and know those costs. If you still remember, I said, please make sure that you know those costs that can be included and in those that are not included in the base cost of an asset. Right. If you still remember, uh, we talked about uh, these advertising costs. We said that they are included in the cost of the what? On the asset. Things like commission uh, are included in the um, uh, cost of an asset. Remuneration of the surveyor, stamp duty, cost of moving asset, installation cost, and all those costs. They are included in the cost uh, in your base cost, right? And we said there are some costs that are not supposed to be included. A uh, cost like uh, the borrowing cost, uh, repairs and maintenance, rates and taxes. Uh, these costs, such as the um, registration of a bond, they are specifically excluded when we determine our cost of them of the, the, the base cost. So that means uh, when we come here to determine our tax value, we are going to come and add. So Mr. Yes. So that means this one is different from that uh, the, the cost price in financial accounting was, because as in financial accounting, you said that you only add um, costs that no, no, are- No, don't apply financial is, accounting here. No, I'm saying like this one is different from it. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, yeah. Yeah, when we do tax, the financial accounting are different. Yeah, right. Uh, we don't include advertising cost in the cost of an asset when we do financial accounting. No, I know. I'm, I was just asking that there is a difference because you know, um, just like the the, the when you when you are want to 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 determine the the the, the base costs here, there are some things that we have to add there are some costs that we have to add Perfect. to to the uh, to the purchase yeah yes yes, yes. which all are right. not normally included when we deal with what with financial accounting yes all right perfect sir. all right so would uh, take things like a uh, advertising costs It's how much? Fifteen thousand. One registration. Specifically excluded. If there were any legal fees for selling the assets, they were going to be included. Right. So this is a one of the situations whereby our base cost can be a different to our tax value, Be, uh, like because they are now advertising costs which were not part of the. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry about that. Oh, that's it. Okay. I thought I'd made a mistake. So that's our base cost. 
then our proceeds two million less adjusted proceeds. Less, uh, sorry, less recoupment. I think this we did together. Minus six, eight, two, nine, eight, nine, five. This one here that we recorded here, we get what we call our adjusted process. Right. Adjusted proceeds. <coughs> Less base cost. This one that we calculated today. Capital gain. Any questions there? On the fixed beauty, capital K. They also sold the land. Land was sold for 500. It had been acquired for four fifty. All right, then we we'll look at the land. The selling price. Five hundred thousand. This cost it doesn't have allowances and stuff like that, so there are no complications here. What do you get? Three nine four seven three seven. Mr. Eugene. Yes. On the selling of the land, they did not say anything about that. So why are we exclu excluding it? Did they say anything about that? Mm -mm. I see here they are talking about what? Wait. Oh, no, no, no. That, down there where they're saying the plot and land was sold as a unit respectively. No, it, it, remember that the VAT I'm talking about, it's on the cost here. Yeah, they talked about VAT here. Yeah. Oh, on the cost. Yes. Okay. No, it's fine. 
That's why I didn't apply the I didn't apply the VAT on the five hundred. I only applied it on the four fifty. And okay, no problem there. Eh? Okay. Right. So that is one o five two six three. Right, we have to check, were there any losses from last year? Remember that if there were any losses from the previous year, they can be claimed as a deduction. I know this one is only the assessed loss on the tax, uh, so there's nothing. If uh, you have to check if there are any uh, credit, uh, uh, assessed capital losses uh, carried forward from last year. So we get our aggregate capital gain, then taxable capital gain. Remember that a company will only be taxed on 80%. Multiply by 971-842. What do you get? Triple seven four four seven four. All right. Then we get our taxable income. And now add everything from where we started. All right. Mr. Eugene. Yes. Um if uh, um if let's say um the the asset were, were 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 sold at a price that is um that is less than the cost there wouldn't have been a, a capital, capital asset most yes. um capital gain most if you sell at what if they like if, if the the selling price was less than the cost price they wouldn't like the, the, have the cost. Been, yeah it would yes. have been a capital loss there would have been a capital loss. Yes. Okay. So it also it also could have been um accounted for, like it also could have been deducted. No, no, no. You cannot just deduct a capital loss. A capital loss you can only push it forward to next year. Oh, all right. Uh -huh. But you have to, but you have to show the calculation here. Yes, um, you show the cal so we're going to show the calculation. Then maybe let's say our figure here was going to show a, a capital loss here. Then we just show that there's an aggregate cap a, a capital loss carried forward to next year. Okay. So even if there's right. a loss, you have to show your calculations. Then you just write that capital a loss a carried forward. All right. See. So if you if uh, instead of a capital gain, you make a capital loss, that capital loss cannot be deducted against the current year's profit it can only be deducted against the future capital gain. So you carry it forward to next day. All right. All right. Let's assess loss. Not forward. Remember that we were told that in the previous year, they didn't assess the loss of 56,000 this one year. If you have a loss, SARS do, do not normally pay you anything, but the next year now, when you get a profit, you can subtract that as loss. Okay. Then you get your taxable income. I hope uh, you guys, you can see that this one is different from the one that uh, was being asked just now. 
So if a capital loss, you don't subtract it. But in assessed loss uh, brought forward from last year, it can be deducted against the current year's profit. But a capital loss can only be deducted from capital gain. Hey, assessed loss. Can you please repeat that again, sir? I said in a, a, a capital loss cannot be deducted against current year's income. It can only be uh, deducted against the future capital gains. Capital right. losses can only be deducted from capital gains. I want to make a distinction between that capital loss and this loss here. This one is the taxable loss that is uh, coming from last year. This one can be deducted against the current year's taxable income. Oh. So I'm distinguishing it from the capital loss altogether. But if we had capital losses from last year, they were going to be deductible against this amount here. Okay, so that means that assessed loss is the is the is a taxable um loss loss that from means last, last year, year when they did their when they calculated this figure, they found taxable. a negative figure. Yeah. All right. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's clear. All right. Any questions? Right. If you don't have any questions, then I'll give you a 10 minute break. And so we'll continue in about 10 minutes. Don't worry, I will not take you for long. I will just do up to around three, then we are done. So let's say it's now it's around a six past, let's say by 20 past we should be starting. I'll, same link. All right. All right. Um, let me quickly go to the next one. We uh... right. Uh, Mr. Mabena Morulong is the financial director of Defend by Private Limited. He has been married uh, to his wife, Mrs. Senzeni Morulong, for 25 years, and they are married out of community of property. Okay, we will also discuss the consequences if they were married in community of property. Uh, Mr. Morulong, Morulong uh, purchased a three bedroom flat in Cape Town on 1 April 20, 1999 for 225,000 uh, that was rented out as a holiday accommodation. The flat has been rented out for the past 22 years and Mr. Moroleng re recently decided to sell the flat and buy a larger house in Cape Town where they could live. During 2005, Mr. and Mrs. Moroleng had improvements done to the flat amounting to 320. On 1 October 2001, the flat was valued at 1.2 million and the tab cost was 351,815. The flat was sold for 2,900,000 on 1 July 2021 to an unconnected person. Calculate the tax for capital gain for the 2022 year of assessment for the financial director of Defendify for the 2022 year of assessment. Right, uh, one thing that you should understand is we're not dealing with Defendify here. We're talking about Mr. Moroleng. So this is an individual. We're talking about the capital gain of an individual, not of a um, company. Right. Uh, now, this one was bought before uh, 1 October 2001. And I think you remember from our previous sessions, we said that 1 October 2001 is a very important date when it comes to capital gains because that's when the capital gains tax regime uh, came, uh, uh, that's when it arose, that's when they started using it. So uh, there are issues that would then have to kick in. Right. Uh, now there are rules that have to be followed. Uh, so for now, uh, please, I'm, I'm dealing with the rules here. 
I'm dealing with the with, with the rules. So please, uh, it's not necessarily answering the question. It's the general rules that you can use on any question. Right. Uh, if an asset was acquired, before on or before two thousand and one we have determined the evaluation did value which is called the PDV. So all those assets need to be determined their value on 1 October 2001, which you call the valuation date value. You will see why the valuation date value is um, important. All right. It can be either that valuation date value can either be the market value on that on 1 October 2001, if it can be determined. It can also be what, what we call a time apportionment base. Uh, there are ways to calculate it, uh, but maybe we'll talk about it some other day. Or it can be the 20, we can use what we call the 20% rule. We can also use the 20% rule, right? Uh, whether to use any of those depends uh, on the scenario that uh, we are looking at, right? If the proceed exceeds the total of expenditure incurred before one October two thousand and one and after one October two thousand and one. And we're only uh, talking about expenditure that can be considered for capital gains purposes 2001. Then apply paragraph 26. Then if a proceed a do not exceed the total expenditure uh, incurred before and after 1 October 2001, then you apply paragraph 27. So those will be the rules that uh, you have to be used, either paragraph 26 or paragraph 27 of the eighth schedule. Right. Let me just write of the X eighth schedule. So these complications uh, come into play when uh, we are dealing with assets acquired on or before uh, on or before one October two thousand and one. So they are not the these complications are not necessary if you are dealing with any other assets. So we have to check what are the proceeds uh, from the sale and what are the so applying to this scenario, the proceeds from the sale, uh, we are told that this flat was sold for 2.9 million. So uh, proceeds $2.9 million. Let's determine expenditure. All right, expenditure before one October 2001. This can be the acquisition, it can be the uh, improvements that were incurred on this uh, flight. Right, they said that they bought it on for 225 on 1 April 20, 1999. I think that was the only expenditure that they. In CAD before one October. 
So that is a 225,000. Right, so 225,000. Then expenditure after. One October. This can also include those expenditures like advertising, uh, any legal costs, any installations that can be done later. But it doesn't include those things like repairs, uh, the registration of bonds, uh, those other things like uh, way and TA and stuff like that. We don't include them here. Right. So this is the uh, improvements uh, to the flat amount into 320. Right, so the total expenditure. So you don't include things like repairs and maintenance, things like uh, a registration of bonds and stuff like that. But you would include, a, if you are selling the asset, you would include the advertising and stuff like that. Right, 545. So you can see that proceeds are greater than, are greater than expenditure. The process at 2.9 million. Therefore, apply paragraph 26. So then apply paragraph 26. Right. A then the next thing you have to check. Does the market value on valuation date? And whenever we say valuation date, valuation date is 1 October 2001. Exceed proceeds on disposal. Your answer to this uh, will determine how you are going to uh, determine your valuation detail. Right. So in this case, if you can see here, The market value in 2001 was valued at 1.2. And the market value is less than the proceeds. Market value of 1.2 is less than process in this particular case Therefore, the base cost of the asset Will be the sorry, not not the best cost, the valuation date value will 
o pick call. To the market value. If the market value was more than the proceeds, you were then also going to a, a determine if the uh, proceeds can be determined, uh, proceeds incurred before 1 October can be determined. Then if they can be determined, like in this case, a, the, the tab was also going to come into account. Then our VDV was going to be the higher of the market value and the 20% rule in the tab. But then if we cannot determine the expenditure before 1 October 2001, then the tab is not used. Like in this case, the tab was there. So we could use the higher of the, let me just put it here. That means the higher of market value on 1 October. Then we would have the tab, takes apportionment base and proceeds minus after 1 October course. times 20%. Uh, that is if we can determine the cost incurred before 1 October 2001. But if we can't determine uh, the cost before 1 October 2001, then we will not uh, 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 include the tab. We will not include the tab, so there will be no tab here. So only have the higher of market value in the proceeds minus after October 2001 comes. Right. So please, you should make sure that you listen properly so that you don't mix up what I've just said. Right. So the our value valuation debt value is a, a 1.2. So base cost would be equal to VDV plus expenditure after 1 October 2001. If it was not an individual, we're also going to deduct our capital expenditure, right? But because we're dealing with an individual in this case, so if our VDVs, there's no a, a capital, capital expenditures. So our VDV will be 1, 200,000, then cost in kids after 1 October 2001, which is the 320,000, will get our, will give us the base cost. which is equal to this. Then we'd have our selling price which is 2.9 million. Base cost So please, you should know that for individuals, there are no capital allowances. So there's no that recoupment. We won't have that uh, recoupment and stuff like that. Right. Then we get our aggregate capital gain. If there were many assets, we we're going to calculate one by one, then you get the overall. But here we only have one, one asset. That's why it's, uh, that automatically becomes our aggregate capital gain. 
right, individuals, you've got an annual exclusion. Right, sorry, before I proceed, if these guys were married in community of property, this gain could have belonged to them, both of them. So uh, Mr. Moroleng was going to have 50% of the gain if they were married in community of property. But since they are married out of community of property, the whole gain will belong to Moreleng. So you should read properly there. So if they are married in community of property, the profit will be shared 50%, 50-50. But since they are not married in community of property, all the profit belongs to Moreleng. Then uh, for individuals, there's an annual exclusion of 40,000. That means uh, you will not be taxed uh, uh, on the what? Actually, this is capital gain, not aggregate here. Because the aggregate will be after deducting that annual exclusion. So for individuals, on all your capital gain, there is an exclusion of forty thousand, which you will not be, uh, you will not be taxed. It's a fixed figure of forty thousand. Right. So on all your capital gains, there is an annual exclusion of forty thousand. Then, if you sell a primary residence, that is your main your main house where you are staying. If it's your primary resident, let's say if this flat was the main house that uh, Mr. Moreleng was staying. There's a two million uh, exclusion. There's a two million exclusion. That means you won't pay tax uh, on two million of the capital gain. If it's a primary residence. And if you are married in community of property, on that property, your exclusion will not be two million, it will be one million, one million. Right. So then a uh, taxable capital gain, right? Uh, I think you remember that companies, we said 80% is the taxable capital gain. For individuals, the taxable capital gain is 40%. For individuals, the taxable capital gain is 40%. Mutanden. Uh, yes, Eugene. The annual exclusion, the 40,000, if we married in community, will it be 20% or will it remain the, I mean, will it be 20,000 or will it remain the same 40? No, the, it's 40,000 per individual, as an individual. Oh, so after, individual. Calculating, after calculating your, all your capital gain, then you have an exclusion of 40,000. Okay. But so you share the only... capital gain 50-50, then on your portion, you take out 40,000. Oh, okay. Right. So the, uh, please, uh, the taxable capital gain for individuals is not 80%. For companies, it's 80%. For individuals, it's 40%. So after calculating the, the total, uh, the capital, the net capital gain, if there were any assets losses brought forward from last year, they were going to be deducted. After deducting them, whatever remains, you will be taxed only 80, uh, 40% if you're an individual. So please, that's another point of departure from uh, from businesses. Businesses is eighty percent capital gain, which is taxable. Individuals, it's forty percent. And also for individuals, case now use assets are not subject to what to to capital gain. So your wardrobes and your stuff like that, they are not part of the capital gain regime. They are what are called a personal use assets, which will not fall into the category for determining your capital gains tax. All right. Then next. A briefly describe what implications are if Moro Lengs only the accommodation is in his primary residence. Right, I will not write anything here. Right, if this was a primary residence, then he was going to qualify for a 2 million exclusion. So that means he was not going to pay any, uh, uh, there will not be any taxable capital gain. 
because this aggregate gain of 1 million 340 is uh, already less than 2 million so the 2 million uh, annual exclusion would kick in so since the capital gain does not even reach 2 million uh, that means you will not be uh, paying any income tax on the property. So if a, it's a primary residence, it will be subject to the 2 million primary residence exclusion. So any capital gain be, be, be 2 million or less will not be will not be taxable. But if you get capital gains of more than 2 million now, the excess above 2 million is the one that will be taxed. You take out the 2 million exclusion, then you deal with the rest. So that could have been the implication. Any questions there? Right, let me quickly discuss a uh, one or two things, then we close. Uh, then if you practice, you can ask me later what to do with uh, some of these things. So I will not be writing per se, but I will be discussing so that we can be able to be faster. Maybe I can just do number one there. Right, on the question two, it says, discuss with supporting calculations the income tax consequences for Spavali, private limited in respect of the new machinery purchased for the company's 2021 year of assessment. Right, they bought new machinery here. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, the assistant tax manager of Sipavali provided you with a list of transactions that is he is having a hard time to grasp. Grasp is asked you to provide him with feedback on how to treat each transaction for income tax purposes with explanations. All amounts in the list of transactions below exclude VAT unless otherwise stated. You see now. So in this question, A, unless they say, we assume that there's no VAT. Right. Transaction one. The directors of the company passed the resolution to start manufacturing rechargeable electronic toys without the need for batteries. The company placed an order for the new machine A, with power two solutions in non-resident company trading in Germany for 25000 on 1 June 2020. This transaction took place at arm's length and conditions and power to solutions is not a connected person to Sipavali. Uh, Sipavali. The purchase price excluded a charge of 500 for installing and testing the machinery. Remember installation and testing just like in a financial accounting is added to the cost of the asset. And Sipavali also paid import duties of 12,500. Uh, on the date of the placing the order, Spavali also paid a deposit of 5,000. Uh, the machinery have arrived in South Africa on 15 of, uh, no, no, December 2020, transaction date, and the machine were brought into use on the same date. So the nature of the transaction, the transaction date is 15 December. So that means when we translate it, uh, we we'll translate it uh, at the cost uh, on that date uh, that they uh, acquired the transaction date. Right. So then they said the, the balance was settled on 31 January 2021. Right. Our year is ending on the, in the, they said 2021 year of assessment let me just i think this one is a continuous i think i uh, please uh, these things are related up to number five uh, the year is ending the company's financial year ends on the last day of march actually the whole question was starting from number five there but i wanted you to do the part at the end so they are related from number two to five there so the year end is March, uh, it's March. And so this, this one was paid before year end. It was paid before year end because they are saying that it was paid on uh, uh, 31 January, 2022. 
2022. 2021, sorry. Sorry, sorry. So it was paid within the year. Right. Uh, so what are the implications here? There's a complication, a small one. Right. What is the cost of this asset? Right. Uh, we should know that number one, our cost of this asset will have to be determined uh, at different rates here. The 5,000 was paid on date of placing order. Uh, so the an amount that is already paid is not outstanding. So it doesn't wait for the transaction date. So uh, on that day that they placed the order, that is 1 June. So this 5,000 was paid on 1 June. So we have to translate it at the exchange rate on 1 June. So that means we're going to say, when we determine our cost of the machine, so we'll have our deposit It was already paid, so we don't have to uh, uh, deal with the transaction date here. Any amount paid, it's good that we have dealt with this one so that we can be able to. Because on that one June, that's when they paid it. So you any amount paid, you have to deal with it at that transaction date. What do we get? $79,950, thank you. Then the balance of uh, 20,000. Would say 25,000 minus 5,000. Eugene, where are the we 500 for installation. Eugene? Yes. Where are we getting the balance of 25,000? Is that the amount is 25,000? It's given. Is it? Didn't see. Is that the cost is given is 25,000? Unless if I, if I, was like, I, I'm afraid that the way I'm writing now, if I move from this page, everything will be off. Let me just try to, to access the paper from- No, Anna. you are right. Uh, it was 25,000 indeed. It's fine. I saw it, Eugene. Okay. So out of that 25, five was paid. So the balance is the what? 20. But there's also the 500. Remember that they said the 500 uh, for installing and testing, it's excluded in that other charge. The, uh, uh, okay. It says the purchase price excluded the charge of 500 for installing and testing 500 pounds. So that's why I'm adding it there. This one would use the transaction date, which they say it's 15 December 2020, which is here, yeah, 15 December 2020, times 16.54. Remember that any amount outstanding, we use the transaction date. What do we get? Treated nine thousand and seven. Then import duty. Four five hundred.
what do you get? Three five one five seven. So this will be the cost of the machine. Right. So this cost of the machine, remember that it's capital in nature, so it cannot be deductible uh, for tax purposes as it is, but uh, the company can qualify for uh, capital allowances. Any questions there? Why not yet done? Then on 31 January, I will come to the allowance because we need to find out the type of company. If it's a small business corporation, we'll apply section 12 key. If it's a, because this is a manufacturing asset. If it's not a small business corporation, we'll apply section 12 C. Right. Then number two, on 31 January, that's when we were told that they are going to pay. I think the gentleman who was asking in the morning, like this one is paid before year end. Right, we we'll account for the movement in the exchange rate for that balance only, not for the 5,000, but the balance. There's a deterioration in the rand here. So there's a foreign exchange loss. Which is what? A uh, 20,500. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my 2,500 is this one here. 25,000 plus 5,000 plus minus 5,000 plus 500. Multiply by the difference, which is 16.98. The date of the payment. So here, if you can see, we're not using the end of year because this one was paid before year, end of year. We're using the date when the payment happened the date when the payment happened. We get what? 9,020. So that will be the loss that will be cognized. And on that one match, there's no, there's, no, there's no transaction because the debt will have already been paid. We no longer have any foreign exchange uh, adjustments for losses or gains because it will have been sold. Right, then my friends, uh, please, I want you to keep this figure here, because as I move from this page, it will not be there. And also my friends, this figure will not be there when you, it will only be on the recording. You won't find it on the Excel sheet. It will, it will not, but on the recording, you can be able to get it. So you can go towards the end of the recording. Right, I'm now removing this page, but I will need this figure 351570. Or maybe let me just move a uh, whilst it's them. All right, I want to check what type of company. As I told you that we are starting from number five, it's a continuous question. All right, this company is a small business corporation. If it's a small business corporation, we apply section 12 E. So they will qualify again, because they said if we, uh, tell, uh, we should give out all uh, consequences on this machine, right? Considering that this is a machine a, and it's a small business corporation, that means they will have a 100% deduction according to section 12 E allowance. Because this is a small business corporation, they will qualify for a 100% deduction in the first year because this is a manufacturing asset. If it was not a manufacturing asset, then they were going to uh, have the 40% instead. Considering that uh, they bought a new machine. If it's not a small business corporation and it's not a new machine, it will be 20%, 20%. But if it's an uh, old machine, if it's a new, it's 40% in the first year. And you should remember that Section 12E allowance and Section 
C allowances are not apportioned. So we don't have to look at the fact that it was uh, received on 15 December, that is not an issue, uh, uh, as long as it was brought into use. But if it was not brought into use, then there will not be any allowance. Remember, SARS will only grant you an allowance when the asset has been brought into use. Since it's a small business corporation and this is a manufacturing machine, then there will be a 100% deduction in that first year. Any questions? Right. So if you don't have any questions, my friends, uh, can you just try to look at all the other things? If you have any questions, then you can ask. Uh, please, my my my, my 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 these days because of the revision and stuff like that, it's a little bit hectic. That's why you see me maybe replying late. Uh, but please feel free, especially if it's in the evening or very early in the morning. Uh, you can you feel free to call if it's a problem. Uh, because what happens is you can send the WhatsApp and then you see that it's replied very very late. So if it's uh, serious, just call or just buzz then I know that it's a little bit agent, uh, considering that you are writing. Uh, then I will see that I will give it a preference to attend to it, whatever you will have sent via WhatsApp. Please, for all the questions, if you want general information, you go to number five, this first paragraph. Number five, this first paragraph. It applies to all the number two, three, four, and five. This first paragraph. For general information, refer to number five. Okay, thank you so much. So we can be discussing until you write. Until just before you write, not until you write, sorry. Until just before you write. Okay, thank you so much and God bless you richly and enjoy your audience.